in our coronavirus response to bring our future and medicine for justice. I'm Sherilyn Steele, Program Manager of Grantmakers in the Arts. This webinar will be live streamed on the GIA website. For participants who are deaf, hard of hearing, or request accommodation, live captioning and ASL interpretation will be available via the live stream. The links for these have been provided to the left of your screen in the notes section. This is our second coronavirus response webinar, and we have seen immense energy from funders around flexibility and trust over the past few months. We've been acting fast with limited to no requirements for applications, repurposing current grant program or favor of GPS, above five minimum, and centering experiences for their grantees. These elements of rapid response can inform structural changes for how we can operate in the future if we are committed to long-term change. We're glad to have Randy Engstrom, Director of Seattle Office of Arts and Culture. Charles Johnson, Program Director of Arts at the Geraldine R. Dodge Foundation. Dana Hawaoka Chen, Executive Director of Justice Funders. And Justin Lang, Principal Consultant of Flow LLC. We are calling for and working toward a more liberated future of grant making. And on this webinar, we will explore what is necessary to reimagine systems, power, and practice in response to this pandemic and the ongoing crisis of racial inequity. We're glad to have all of these presenters joining us today. Beginning the presentation, there will be an opportunity for you to submit your responses to questions. Please do so in the Q&A box to the bottom of your screen. There will also be an opportunity for you to write a one sentence entry to relate to this activity. And at the very end of the presentation, I will be joining again to facilitate the Q&A. And with that, I will turn it over to our presenters. Welcome Dana, Justin, Sharnita, and Randy. Dana, why don't you get us started? Thanks so much, Sherilyn. And hello, everyone. This is Dana from Justice Funders. Thank you all for welcoming me into your home offices. Today's um, just so you know, I'm participating uh, from unceded Ohlone land in what is also known as San Jose, California. Um, so let's get some audience participation going here. Today's webinar is focused on systems for justice. Before we get to that in the chat, I'd like to invite folks to type in your responses to the following question. What systems does institutional philanthropy perpetuate? So if folks could chat in their responses to that. Hi to those who have just joined. If you can, in the Q&A box, please type in your response to the question on the screen. What systems does institutional philanthropy perpetuate? Hopefully folks are typing in. Um, just in the interest of time, I'm going to advance to just say that some of the things that I think uh, Sherilyn mentioned in her intro are things around um, white supremacy, the culture of begging for funds, um, the white savior complex. We're starting to see um, inaccurate meritocracy. Um, I would also lift up economic inequality. So yes, um, all of you who are working in the field have a sense that these are the things that our current systems perpetuate. And so one of the things that um, our research at Justice Funders has found um, is that in order to build a future that reimagines systems, we need to really understand how the current system of philanthropy got built and what structures and systems perpetuate them. So hopefully uh, you'll see in the reading that was posted on the registration uh, webpage for this program, 
um, that one of the things we learned through stifled generosity is that like other forms of wealth in the U.S., philanthropic wealth can be directly traced back to industries of extraction and exploitation, including slavery, stolen land from indigenous people, and the systemic undervaluing of women's work. However, it was the Revenue Act of 1913 that we found to have codified several things. Public charities and independent foundations had been in existence for decades and had operated for the public good. This act formally started the era in which tax policy regulated philanthropic activities and incentivized charitable giving. These laws created a distinct nonprofit sector defined by their legal status. So this was the beginning of the nonprofit industrial complex in which the government had the ability to monitor, monitor and control social movements. And it also created a reliance then on state and foundation and corporate funding um, that has also served to derail then the power of social movements. Um, from there, we found other uh, policies that we documented that pull out the ways in which um, philanthropy has now become a tax shelter for wealth. Um, our colleagues at Grantmakers for Effective Organizations, or GEOs, um, has uh, lifted up the ways in which the culture of philanthropy then um, is really coming from three dominant fields, academia, banking, and for-profit corporations. So the ABCs of philanthropy. We see this manifest in how philanthropy privileges experts with an educational pedigree, how the job roles in philanthropy are program officers instead of loan officers, where these folks are expected to perform a sense of due diligence to mitigate risk, and the role of a board of directors um, for foundations that are similar to corporations. So I start here to offer this context because while it may be easy for us to talk about what's wrong with institutional philanthropy, it may not always be easy for us to say why. You'll see here that this is the just transition framework that's been articulated by the Climate Justice Alliance and Movement Generation. On the left, you'll see a representation of our current economy, which we would characterize as being organized around the right to accumulate wealth through the exploitation of labor, extraction of our natural resources, and enforced through militarism. The just transition then is for us to begin to hospice this economy while building the one on the right, which privileges people and planet thriving by being in deep relationship with one another that allow for the um, wealth of the productive labor of each community to remain in that community and be governed by deep democracy. As our colleague Ed Whitfield of the Fund for Democratic Communities says, the wealth of foundations is derived from the wealth that was created by laboring people. To us, that means there is a moral imperative to give it back to the communities where it was generated and to do so in ways to ensure that it is used as a productive asset. This is why Justice Funders has decided to use our perch in philanthropy to call for a just transition in philanthropy. We believe that philanthropy must support the agency of communities to implement solutions and reimagine models for governing philanthropic resources human, financial, and knowledge that redistribute wealth, democratize power, and shift economic control to communities. I believe that Nadia and Sherilyn um, posted our link to resonance again on the uh, registration page. So the way to begin uh, your philanthropy's just transition in whatever your starting point is, is to identify ways to operationalize your values within all aspects of your organization. Uh, a just transition will look different for each philanthropy as it does for each community. Um, here, we offer some of our interpretations of the ones that Climate Justice Alliance and Movement Generation created for the just transition framework. The one moves us to Buenza Vir. In philanthropy, uh, we offer that some of these principles guide us to shift our thinking about the many actions we could take as an inherently privileged perspective to thinking about what is necessary for all to thrive. We think about how do we uphold self-determination and build deep democracy, which really means ending paternalistic behaviors and controlling behaviors towards our grantees that are based in risk aversion and moving towards authentic partnership where grantees retain the right to design solutions for their lives rather than having these approaches uh, imposed on them. 
we look at how we can equitably redistribute resources and power and really think about what does redistribution look like? Um, how do we get beyond the 5% payout? I mean, we use all of the capital at our disposal to really combat inequity. And how do we really build what we need now? How do we act with the level of um, resource that we see um, needed in the world right now? Um, as this uh, conversation is also about reimagining systems, I think the conversation in philanthropy has often been about, well, what about diversity, equity, and, and inclusion? At Justice Funders, we would uh, offer that DEI is a means to an end and not the end itself. These are critical steps towards transferring decision-making and control to communities that are most impacted by injustice. However, if our intention is to build a future that reimagines systems for justice, this analysis from Dr. Ibram X. Kendi is particularly provocative and particularly salient in this moment. He says, racism and capitalism emerged at the same time in 15th century Western Europe, and they've reinforced each other from the beginning. Slavery and colonialism accumulated the wealth that powered capitalist expansionism. To be an anti-racist is also to be an anti-capitalism, an anti-capitalist. So given where we are now, how do we move our institutions from a place of extraction to one of regeneration? It begins with transforming our underlying approach to capital, away from an approach where individuals and institutions have the right to endlessly accumulate capital and make decisions on how it should be allocated for the public good, and towards an approach where the collective capacity of communities most impacted by extraction and exploitation are able to produce for themselves, give to and invest directly in what their communities need, and retain the returns generated from these investments. It also means that we have to transform our underlying approach to philanthropy. We need to move away from an approach where foundations maintain power, accumulate wealth, and grow their endowments indefinitely um, to one in which foundations are actively supporting new economic systems that transfer the management and control of financial resources away from institutions and into the hands of communities who have been impacted by wealth accumulation and the extractive economy. As our colleague Edgar Villanueva at the Schott Foundation says, all of us who have been forced to the margins are the very ones who harbor the best solutions for healing, progress, and peace by virtue of our outsider perspectives and our resilience. When we reclaim our share of resources, when we recover our places at the table and the drawing board, we can design our healing. We can create new ways of seeking and granting access to money, and we can return balance to the world by moving money to where the hurt is the worst. From there, uh, we offer seven sets of practices that philanthropies can begin to transition from extraction to regeneration. They include relationship to communities, leadership, operations, endowment, grant-making strategy, grant-making process, and grant-making decisions. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we seem to have lost the audio for the presenters. I'll get that right back. Hold on. Hi, this is Dana. I'm so sorry. Um, I got cut off. Oh, yeah. Dana, you're back with us. So thank you. Continue, please. Sorry, folks. Apologies for the technological difficulties. Um, I just wanted to uh, 
root back in to say that uh, Justice Funders believes that each philanthropic organization is fully capable of restructuring how our resources are deployed more cooperatively, restoratively, and regeneratively. Um, and so in order to actually practice this, I'd like um, to invite folks to get a piece of scratch paper. And with your non-dominant writing hand and in cursive, I'd like you to try to write the following sentence. Regenerative systems will require us to build new muscles. So if you can, on a piece of scratch paper with your non-dominant writing hand, regenerative systems will require us to build new muscles. If you can, again, in the chat, I'd invite folks to share how that's going with you. And Sherilyn, if you could uh, share that back. <laughs> uh, we're seeing impossible, hard to do, yes. Awkward, yes, uncomfortable. So if I can submit to you all, um, this exercise is really analogous to the work before us. It's easier, faster, more comfortable to do things that we already know how to do. And in the status quo, we may get rewarded for doing so. However, if we're really about reimagining systems for justice, it's not only about how we get competent, in our ability to relearn how to do all the things we already know how to do, but to do so with a different intention and in conditions where it will be the spaces that you create that support this practice. So in closing, our movements today are waging some of the most courageous fights to build, contest, and win power. And at the same time, we're witnessing communities around the country incubate, launch, and build alternative economies. When we consider the magnitude of these natural and man-made disasters happening, we need all of our philanthropies to go all in on helping us to usher the world we want, the world that we need. Each of your foundations has control over your own story. It will be our grandchildren who can look back and determine whether or not we perpetuated the status quo or gave birth to a new world. The narrative of the future has yet to be written, but requires us to start now. Thank you. Um, I will now pass it over to my colleague, Justin. Justin. Okay. Okay. Hope everybody's doing well out there. Thanks, Dana. Um, thanks to Grant McCreary, the Arts, just for the, the opportunity to be a part of the conversation. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that we just heard in the framework um, from Dana, um, I think if you look at it, it gives us a North Star in arts philanthropy to think about a world where we don't have arts philanthropy. If you take, I think if you follow the logic of it, that eventually to have actual community um, control over their own resources, there has to be a whole different governance structure. And so what I want to talk about today, I guess, is a little bit around the idea of, of well, what might interim steps look like, or what I'm offering here is black radical fractals. I'll talk a little bit more about that definition. but. Um, what might be the specific steps in arts and cultural philanthropy, and how do we look at the way that art plays a particular role in the structure of white supremacy and racial capitalism, and how is either program officers or folks working in community, how could we start to get more um, clarity around this is the thing that we're going to be trying to um, replace. And so I think that's the, the long-term strategy to the question that was asked, what might be a long-term strategy. That seems to me to be a long-term strategy. Um, but I think that would require, obviously, a much broader base. I don't think it's simply, as I think we all know from working in the field, it's not just a, a technical task of like learning you know, some theory and some ideas and then going to work. Because I think the truth is that philanthropy you know, has its own structure within it. 
um, so that you have this even class structure even inside the organization. So even though you have the foundation to grantees, you also have the foundation of program officers, and you work in the field and you kind of get this sense that you know that it's not so simple as just you offering a good idea. You have some resistance often from the board for, with different issues. And so how do you deal with that? And so one way I think is the second question about how are funders working together. I think we might also talk about how are funders working together and how are they working together with grantees, with publics, and how are we beginning to practice some kind of democracy building that even if it's only an interim step now, it could be the muscle building, to use that same analogy, that could be taken advantage of and further. Um, and I think the last thing regarding this idea of how do we influence systems, I think, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the work of CIA, which, you know, I, I'm, I've been privileged, you know, in all the senses of the word to be, you know, to work with it in prior iterations, you know, on the board, et cetera, um, is that some of the work that's been put out, whether about systemic racism or internalized uh, oppression, whether it's internalized supremacy in terms of white people or internalized inferiority in terms of people of color, is we have a lot of analysis that's gotten out there, um, but what are our applications? And so this, to this idea of fractals and black radical fractals, the, the piece I guess I, I'm, I'm interested in is what are specific steps that we can take? whether it's creating new ways of making decisions, and that was in the article that was posted with this um, webinar that I, that I did a, a few months ago when the coronavirus started, um, whether it's specific rating criteria, whether it's new forms of evaluation that use a racial analysis or use a white supremacy analysis to look at how the program works, how do we start to incorporate these things into the daily practice? The third piece I have up here around um, Black Marxism by Cedric Robinson, is I think you know, he offers one of the ways that I think that the arts and culture field could have influence in this broader system, is he, he talks about how not only did racism and capitalism kind of join, get formed together, but rather, or in addition, I guess you would say, I guess I would say rather, he offered a different theory, that, you know, that European culture gave us capitalism. It's, it's a, uh, it came out of a racialized culture, a culture that saw difference, it saw war, it saw aggression amongst themselves, and capitalism serves those kinds, that, that kind of cultural orientation. So I think one thing that we could offer is to begin some more of a cultural analysis of capitalism, racial capitalism, as he would call it, um, and begin to discuss that, that it's actually, we're seeing a culture, and we see that in the white supremacy culture work. So I think that's one way that we could influence, is that we could begin to get ourselves back at some of the, the larger tables of policy by starting to talk about the role that culture plays um, in terms of even that capitalism itself is a cultural product. <clears throat> so here, you know, I've been interested in the just transition framework and, um, you know, thinking about, hopefully you can read this, hopefully it's legible, um, but that either be, um, what does this look like in the arts field, you know? And so I think in this case here, I'm interested in this middle step, you know, regarding what the um, black radical fractals are, or you will call them non-reformist reforms, but their idea is that what might have in them that if you were to imagine them much expanded, they would have this much greater impact. But you could do them at the level of your program or the level of your foundation because you knew what you were, the principles they were based on, you knew where they were trying to go. So. In this case here, I think on the left side, I have some ideas around the ways that arts and culture philanthropy upholds the white supremacy culture of a, a community. I'm most familiar with urban environments. So I think of some examples like downtowns where I think you see that in many ways they're a monument to white supremacy culture, white supremacy period, because which art forms have the greatest land, have the greatest real estate, have gotten gifts of all different kinds, um, and how does that serve as an ongoing learning place, a place where we learn who matters, who has culture, so on and so forth, who, who are the, the, the folks who really have contributed, you know, the greatest to the world, which is the underpinnings of white supremacy. And I think when we see these other incidences of, like, murder, like we see happening all over the place of black people from police, 
how can we see that also as a cultural expression of a worldview that gets typified sometimes maybe even in the budget of a program? And how do we maybe start to think about language and using that inside the foundation? We might change how we say that, but to start to raise some critical analysis where there are allies, where there are um, folks who are, are willing to listen to that, to start to say this is the way our program upholds that. And in the middle, there are some examples of some steps I think that we could take. Most of it having to do with the way that you constrain capital is through expanding decision making, having broader um, folks who are involved, and particularly being explicit about this is about shifting power back towards BIPOC people, um, and whether that's through an advisory board practice or through, again, that criteria I mentioned, but really trying to take these ideas that we mentioned in the previous slide and look, asking what do they look like even in small applications. And so here are some, and on the right side, I have this idea around pluriversality, um, not my ideas, I mean from a number of other people, but that what we're, if with a cultural critique here, we're saying, you know, diversity, inclusion, and equity has an idea of integrating itself into like a singular frame often. So we want the same frame, we want a different, a variety of people operating inside of it. How do we start to say what kind of cultural landscape would allow a multiplicity of cultural viewpoint, a plurality of cultural viewpoints that might be radically different from one another? And that that's what our field talks about. And some of these fields, these viewpoints, you know, from the indigenous or traditional um, African perspectives are much different than a material base that came out of the Enlightenment. And what kind of system would we need in order so that all those systems had access to the to resources? <clears throat> so I'm not a fan of Milton Friedman. But I think this idea that he had around developing specific reforms and strategies um, was useful in the you know so-called neoliberalism. I think that he you know, he was writing about ideas in the you know the 40s, 50s that didn't get applied till much later. So how do we start to develop ideas around reparations, around our, is it democracy over capital, that then in a larger crisis we'd be able to apply, or if we got to a place where we had more liberated resources, we would have the, the actual systems that we've done on smaller scales in all kinds of manners, um, whether it's how we made decisions, how we evaluated programs, that were using a whole other kinds of sets of criteria, but they were now at a time where we actually had a greater opportunity and we actually have those practices beyond just kind of like language of critique, which I think I feel is a lot of language of but we don't have as much small practice. And that was one of my thoughts with CIA, also that it can continue to be a place to probably negate like the specific small practice that are being used um, that we can learn from. So here are four principles. Um, and so this is, a lot of this is influenced by, um, there's a gentleman named Andres Gores who has a thing around um, labor strategy, but in, in curtailing capital and, and, and managing it. They've been altered a little bit, but I want to draw attention to this notion of accountability um, and that this idea that there's a couple elements to it. And so one might be enforceability. We're not there at the moment. That would be where a community could actually enforce with a foundation or with an arts program, here's the changes that we want because the way the governance is structured, that's not possible at the moment. But Unless you, unless you change the board, which would be the highest level, I think, of really changing power, which again is on that transition that Dana should offer. But at least we could have in these smaller programs answerability, where, where program officers are communicating clearly about what's going on. Obviously, people will participate in public budgeting, even for, again, if it's a, if it's a, if whatever size of resources there are, still practicing these broader democratic principles. And so if we don't have enforceability where you actually have shared equal power, maybe we forgot practice answerability. <clears throat> so my last comments here are around, um, around this idea about language. Because that's a critical aspect. And it's a critical aspect of the battle in philanthropy where in many ways philanthropy, as much as it puts out money, um, I think you could say it puts out language. And so here's some different language. I think that we could take greater advantage of uh, critical race theory, a lot of the language that, that has been offered by that field, taken advantage of by education. Of course, it's a battle inside the foundation to get to some of this language made public, because that's where I think we see the attention of 
greater amounts of power in the organization that will resist narrative change. But I want to offer a couple, and maybe one um, uh, framework, particularly I would draw attention to here, is formal race, which I think is a useful idea to see that a lot of RSPs are using a formal race frame in that they describe black and white, um, Latinx, indigenous, often, particularly, in, uh, well, often they don't describe white at all. They only describe the people of color. White is rarely named. And so, and then also there's rarely a historical component to it. So I think what are what reforms look like where whiteness is actually named in RFPs and actually given some real history to it and then use that as a justification for a different kind of program. And that would be a battle. But I think that's, that would be space where you'd have the more you could do it, the more you learn about it. These are these kind of practical, greater amounts of radicalism that I think that you have to mo you have to monitor the level of the amount of tension that that would create. So that's this model here um, from adaptive leadership, which is you're looking to create. They call them experiments. You can call them fractals. You can call them reforms that generate an, an amount of tension that is going to be felt, but that is not so much that it exceeds and it gets shut down, but that when you see that that you're intentionally trying to create resistance with one of these different strategies because you know that when you get through that, manage well, and you have to do it in concert with other people, which is this other idea around working with other funders and working with other grantees to try to work collectively, um, that once that's done, more space is created in the putting of that uh, together and having that to happen to, again, build on Dana's earlier comment. So this is just a, a list of the summaries here. Um, and I think what, what I would say, I guess, is that, you know, if you're, if we're looking at uh, a number of strategies, whether it's we need more clear application to the principles, we want to restrain capital, we want to look at um, some names for this application that we're, that we're starting to get clear. And you might use a different theory here, but that there would be some analysis that says, I know the long-term goal is a world where we don't have arts and culture resources controlled by such a small sector of the population. And I know that's an expression of racial capitalism, my cultural supremacy. So what are my steps to where I'm going to democratize that? Because that's the grandest thing. No matter how good I get as an individual, what is the way that I'm going to practice this? Um, and so then I have some other examples here around taking advantage, you know, being critical of colorblind analysis, realizing that, that my foundation does have a political framework it's using, let me become more aware of that. Now let me look at challenging it with other frameworks. Uh, let me start to design intentional experiments that have certain principles to them. And then let me be aware that I'm going to create some tension. I'm going to be ready to deal with that and modify it. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, to the extent this is related to the coronavirus, that we have an opportunity now with clearly how coronavirus is impacting folks in other systemic racism, racist ways, what are ways that we then say, well, this is coming from a coronavirus time, but this is actually something that has been passed due. Um, and so I offer these ideas, not only for the moment, but to last going forward. And uh, with that, I'm going to tag it on to uh, Sarnita. Thank you, Justin. Um, and first, I want to say thank you for GIA for organizing this panel. Um, I've been influenced by my colleagues here either indirectly because I follow their work, like the Justice Funders, or directly um, as I've had the opportunity to partner with them, like Randy, as a fellow GIA board member and co-chair of the Racial Equity Committee with me, or Justin, who, along with his colleague Barbary Cook at Dragonfly Partners, worked directly with the Dodge Foundation to develop our theories of change and equity rubric. Um, I think we all bring a different perspective to this work and the topic. And while Dodge has been working on its transformation for several years, it's been largely an internal process. And as we move our work, work toward a more equitable New Jersey, I think it's important that we begin to share out our journey. Although using the term journey is not my favorite because it was not a meandering walk without focus or a goal. Um, I like to think of it more as an agenda with specific things to do and accomplish. 
Um, I think it's important to share this transformation story, and I want to underscore that it is very much a work in progress. And while we have a longer way to go and much more work to do, I think it, demonst it demonstrates the pace and the reality of change. Uh, while we all have a sense of urgency, and many of us more than others, and while we would all like to accelerate our efforts, we may be, in fact, in that moment now. But what I'm really clear about is that the work that the foundation has been engaged in over the last four to five years has positioned us to pivot in response to COVID-19 and given us the context for the change and shifted the conversation internally and externally. Um, I'll begin by saying that the journey hasn't been easy, um, but importantly, it has been both a staff and board endeavor. And we have been learning and experimenting and engaging together. So this slide sort of condenses all of the work that we've been doing over the last 45 years into uh, one page um, and for quick reference. But some of the inflection points on our equity journey I will revisit. So the foundation was established in 1974. It began its work by supporting local leaders across a number of program areas and has almost from the very beginning supported the arts, education, and environment. The foundation has had only four presidents since its founding and has evolved over time to meet the needs of the time. Um, the foundation has done a lot of good work over the, over the years and created a strong technical assistance program for grantees to help them build their boards strengthen financial oversight and leadership, and establish North America's largest poetry festival every other year in Newark. And the foundation has also been there for New Jersey nonprofits after 9-11, the financial collapse of 2008, and supporting the recovery after Hurricane Sandy. And we are once again facing new challenges related to COVID-19. As a statewide funder, Dodge has had many successes in its program and focus areas and was doing good work. But we had an inflection point in late 2015, early 2016, where it was time to reflect and recommit to a longer term existence. And with fluctuating financial returns, we began to examine if we were having the greatest impact. Were we serving the communities most in need? And was our support equitable? We began our work with the Intercultural Development Inventory, the IDI, because it's a tool that helps individuals and organizations understand their cultural competency along a spectrum from denial to adaptation. I had used the IDI and several other organizations, and I think it's a good tool to help people get a baseline understanding of concepts, terminology regarding race and culture, and it's scientific, so people feel relatively comfortable with it. Um, in my experience, it's very much a conversation starter. And Dodd's senior staff took the IDI, then later the board, and the entire staff. A lot of our initial learning was based on these concepts and really helped the organization begin to examine ideas, biases, and helped us understand and chart a path forward that eventually led to significant changes. The work has been incremental. And as we move toward an intercultural mindset, the organization began to have different conversations. We began to understand where we were on the spectrum and that the distinction between minimization, treating everyone the same, and adaptation that requires not only knowledge, but behavior change was vast. And we also doubled down on the question of equity. 
this work took a number of years, numerous partners, and eventually led us to a new strategic plan, mission, vision, and values for the foundation. We committed to creating the conditions for an equitable New Jersey through our program, programmatic lenses, arts, education, environment, informed communities, and poetry, and acknowledge that the historical, institutional, and structural impediments that contributed to some communities in New Jersey having the worst outcomes in every quality of life indicator. And in fact, those were communities of color. We grounded our way forward in our values, as you see here, collaboration, learning, respect, equity, and stewardship. And our new strategic plan, the work of the, the strategic plan was organizational wide with internal, external, programmatic, and financial goals. And as we began to operationalize our work, we partnered with Justin and Dragonfly Partners to help us develop our program theories of change, all centering equity and focusing on communities of color. The program team all created visual representations of our theories of change. This is not actually the one I used for the arts, but this image has become important to me over the last few weeks, so I swapped it for today. It fits because our work in the arts will become much more community and grassroots based. And this image reminds me that people are making art and making statements and making beauty in their communities all the time. Uh, working with Justin and Barbary really led us to a deeper interrogation of how we do our work, how we move forward, and how we prioritize the people and communities we want to partner with for change. After we completed the theories of change, we wanted to create a framework and tools to help not only us, but grantees and others to better understand our new direction have language to address our work, and even to use as guideposts to move toward a more equitable organization and eventually sector. We have also developed a staff accountability rubric to hold program directors accountable to the framework and experimenting with how to operate, operationalize it for the whole staff. The Dodge Equity Framework is represented in this infographic and supports a much more detailed rubric with these seven lenses that we are using to help make grant decisions. It's one tool, it's a way to have conversations and it gives us the opportunity to ground our work and our values as we shift our resources. The framework has seven interconnected focus areas, including three internal factors and three external factors all connected to resources and access. We have plans to roll out the framework and the rubric with large and small convenings, but in the wake of the pandemic, we started to share with colleagues, some grantees, and a number of the pool funds that have been established in New Jersey after the pandemic and that the foundation has contributed. We've also used it to guide our rapid response grants to existing grantees relative to COVID-19 and working with organizations that were led by people of color and or serving majority people of color. So a few of the areas that we've been getting the most questions about are the staff and board diversity. And we felt it was important to put a stake in the ground as a goalpost that the majority of the staff and board of organizations be people of color. The focus of this measure is not to count the people, but that the people count. And the framework as a whole goes sort of beyond diversity and allows us to dig deeper into how systems uphold dominant culture. Another area of interest is the equity mindset. And this is about developing a culture of learning. Um, for example, Dodge has made measurable progress over the last four to five years as a board and staff 
We've developed a new strategic plan, assessed where we are as individuals and as an organization regarding our cultural competence, have factor research and learning into our theories of change, have attended undoing racism and other trainings, and how now we're shifting our work and our resources. The other idea that is interesting to those that we shared it with is the systems impact area. And this is a way for particularly white-led organizations to reflect on how they're using their power and influence to benefit people of color communities. And all of this leads to the access to resources. And this category really takes into consideration organizations' relationships with the foundation over time and how we are working directly with POC-led organizations in their early stages of their life cycle and beyond. So as an organization, I believe that the work the foundation has been engaged in gave us great clarity and credibility and context in response to COVID-19 and what we will be what we what we will be regarding the the reorganization of the nonprofit sector. And as an organization, I'm confident that the conversations we're having internally and externally are much different than prior conversations during other catastrophic times. I believe COVID-19 has affirmed what we have been learning and interrogating, that the systems don't work for all equitably, and that we can and have to ask ourselves new questions and engage with new partners in new ways. And with that, I will turn it over to my colleague, Randy. Thank you so much, Sharnita, and thank you to all of the um, presenters today. It's really a huge honor to share space with uh, with all of them, um, really, really luminaries in our, in our space. I also want to echo the thanks uh, to Grant Makers in the Arts for holding this space for us today. And uh, and in particular, you know, I, GIA has been such a, um, a powerful uh, space of learning for me over the years. I just want to name the, the racial equity work led by Justin Lang, Maureen Knighton, Denise Brown, Angelique Power, Janet Brown, Lulani Arquette, um, some folks who really helped me grow and learn um, around what racial equity and racial justice can mean. Um, and I just value that uh, GIA continues to prioritize this space. Also want to acknowledge that uh, we here on the West Coast also are on indigenous land. In Seattle, we're on the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, still unceded territory um, and still, uh, still unjust. Uh, and it's in the context of all of that that we think about reimagining systems for justice and for the purposes of today, um, I want to talk about sort of what civic reimagination for justice can be as a uh, government agency that also exists in the arts philanthropy space. I think we are duly complicit in structures of white supremacy and structural racism. And I think we have uh, a responsibility to work to dismantle those systems. And I think that that involves the act of, um, of reimagination. Uh, I have said, if you've heard me on any webinars before, that the Office of Arts and Culture was chartered in 1971 during the worst recession in Seattle's history when Boeing laid off 65% um, of its workforce. And there was a billboard next to Boeing Field that said, will the last person out of Seattle please turn out the lights? Uh, the mayor in 1971 was asked why you would form a local arts agency in the context of such a recession. And he said, because you have to give people hope. And though the context and the time is different, I think the need for hope and imagination um, is probably more urgent now than it's ever been in my life. I wanna talk a little bit about what we learned and the implications of that for um, recovery and reimagination. I wanna walk through the sort of three phases of what COVID did, uh, how it landed, how it impacted and the opportunities it presented in our community, and then dig a little deeper um, into the civic reimagination um, idea and what that means for our work going forward. Uh, as was said by both Justin and Sharnita, and I think is clear to most folks, uh, COVID-19 was an accelerant. It amplified the structural inequity and the structural racism that was already 
here. Um, and I think that uh, that has only been re more reinforced, uh, the events of the last three weeks. And I think that the urgency of the moment has become even more acute. Sharna Sharnita spoke to the moment that we are in, and I, and I think it is evident, as evidenced by this ground plane mural that the uh, city of D.C. <laughs> did overnight uh, to, to, to send a message around their values. It's also worth noting that uh, the organizers in D.C. painted their own mural that said defund the police, not so far from this mural. And I think that gets to the um, what I'd call the comfort with discomfort uh, that Justin spoke about. This is uh, for us to fundamentally change our work. Uh, it's going to it's going to require us to, to shift our practice, and that's not going to be easy or comfortable. Um, but there's been this conversation, uh, as I've been in spaces for the last three months, about what does building back mean? Are we going back to where we were in January 2020, or are we fundamentally reimagining and building back better? And I really think we have the opportunity and the responsibility uh, to, to, to reimagine these systems. A huge part of that, as Justin, I think, outlined really, really well, is um, the questions of governance and who decides who decides. So much of our grant-making practice is about who's in the panel room. Uh, and I think we need to meaningfully center BIPOC voices. We need to uh, seed some governance and some power in a meaningful way to those uh, communities. Uh, and, and we need to uh, put our resources where our mouth is. Um, we might be past uh, the time for trainings and statements. It might be time for action and investments. Uh, and I think what that means for recovery is reimagining our field. We have had success as a practice in the city of Seattle um, utilizing racial equity toolkits to center communities of color, in particular BIPOC communities, for how resources will be distributed. I think this should um, go beyond programmatic interventions and really be about systems design. And I'll talk about what some of those systems are um, a little bit later. Uh, we know that government can't decide this for people, that it has to decide, it has to create this with people. Uh, we have to honor what has been uh, asked for in the past, but we also have to bring community to the table, bring BIPOC community specifically to the table so they can uh, help create the systems and the changes on their own terms that will be impacting their lives. And I think going back to the status quo uh, is not an option. Uh, so there were really three periods of time uh, that impacted the cultural sector and the city, uh, and I'll spend a little bit of time on each of them. March was really about um, the, 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 the immediate response, the short-term relief work. Uh, April was really about seeing artists really as, as the belonging strategy for the city and really lifting up the way that community came together uh, to look out for each other. And then May is when we started to look to the future and really think about resilience and recovery in a structural way. Uh, so in March, you know, <laughs> well, in February, on February 26th, the first case of COVID in the United States was reported in Seattle. On February 29th, the first death from COVID was reported in Seattle. By March 9th, we were, we were <laughs> closing down uh, events over, over 500. And by March 16th, we had closed everything. And that had a massive impact, as we all know, on the cultural sector, on individual artists, and on cult uh, cultural organizations. Um, we partnered with uh, the luminary artist and author Ijoma Oluo to support her Artist Relief Fund for, for $50,000. We also invested in Artist Trust, another $50,000 to help uh, individual artists uh, who, were, who were being impacted. We, I think, were the first local arts agency to do a, re a stabilization fund, a relief fund, and we did this not by asking people to apply, but literally by amending people's contracts and just giving them more money. Um, that was both wonderful in its responsiveness and also is something for us to think about going forward in terms of uh, its structural analysis. We also were able to partner with uh, Seattle Center and, and the Parks Department uh, and offer rent reduction to a number of organizations. Uh, all told, uh, we wound up putting about $1.8 million into the sector um, through those different interventions. Um, I just want to lift up the Artist Relief Fund from Ijoma, uh, both because it raised $620,000, which is incredible, um, and also because it launched uh, on March 9th. It, they did not wait uh, for, for the full impact of COVID. They did not get trapped in process. 
uh, BIPOC artists went ahead and stood up a process by which they took care of not themselves, but everyone around them. And I think that that's been a powerful beacon as we've thought about the reimagination space. In April, um, we really started to see the, uh, the work that local communities, uh, local artists, local cultural workers were doing in community, and we wanted to lift that up. We also recognized there was this unanticipated consequence of everybody sheltering in place for weeks and months, which is that there's, there's a real mental health impact of that. So how could we uh, support and resource our creative community to uh, foster belonging and social cohesion as we experience this isolation? Um, and how can we uh, how can we break the sort of feelings of isolation while we're physically forced to be apart? We were really intentional um, to center uh, BIPOC community efforts through this work. There's a website, settletogether.org, which you can go to. Um, it highlights a lot of the different sort of mutual aid efforts that are happening in our community. It also highlights arts and culture interventions that are happening. Um, some that, that the city led, like, like this uh, Public Art Comes to Your Front Yard campaign, where we hired 10 artists of color to produce pro-social yard signs that, um, that helped us spread messages about uh, public health information and also just about belonging, and uh, non-sanctioned events like all the incredible murals that came up uh, all over the city. Um, we wanted to support both formal and informal work, and we wanted to lift up the incredible work that our cultural sector was doing. And then we started to turn our focus from relief to recovery. Um, we formed a community resilience subcabinet, which had sort of three areas that it was focused on, economic recovery, civic reimagination, and community support. And I'll talk a little bit about what those mean. But uh, at, the, at, the, at the base of all of this, we are trying to reimagine a city that is driven by a commitment to racial equity, climate justice, creativity, and culture. Uh, in all of the policy and systems change work that we want to do, we have to center BIPOC communities and we have to have them at the table to design the interventions. Um, when we're talking about an economic recovery, we're looking at the roadmap to an inclusive creative economy that we constructed last year. We're talking about a workers recovery. We're looking at the role of labor and how do we protect vulnerable contract and gig workers. Uh, we can't just we can't just put people back to work. We have to put people back to work in a better system, and it's inherently challenging in a in an extractive system like capitalism to think about liberatory structures. But what are the ways that we could create more just economies and more just systems of work? Um, there's a lot of interesting work uh, that we've been fortunate to be doing around uh, community wealth building, and I think when when Justin talks about the images of our downtown uh, as sort of the, the, the tributes to white supremacy, I don't think we can kid ourselves about where resources have and haven't been invested historically from a government standpoint. I think we have to get a lot more aggressive about the contribution of land and resources and power uh, in a way that we haven't done in the past. And there's some really great work emerging. Uh, we've had an equitable development initiative for a number of years that's really community driven. Uh, we've talked we've we've talked about how to center cultural space and cultural spaces uh, in the hands of community, and we're trying to move wealth to communities at scale, and that's going to be a huge priority. Um, digital equity and the digital divide. Uh, not only were so clear um, as as a um, determinant of who would be successful in the last three months and who wouldn't. But it also is such an underpinning of what the future of work and the future of, of the economy is going to be. We have to ensure that everyone has access to, to the Internet, to broadband. We have to ensure that everyone has access to the digital tools uh, that are required to, um, to be able to work uh, in, 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 our, in our future. And so digital equity is going to be a citywide sort of civic priority. Um, and then, you know, public works is a really interesting space, but everything from a Green New Deal to a WPA style program, uh, as we as a city and as a country are staring down unemployment that is pretty unprecedented, um, we're going to have to get pretty ambitious with, uh, with what we're willing to do as, as government. And one of the initiatives that we've been sort of sculpting in collaboration with a lot of other departments and community partners, we call the Creative Hope Initiative, which aims to center uh, BIPOC artists and cultural organizations, both, both cultural workers and culinary workers, 
and invest in them to reimagine some of these systems going forward. They can either do short-term mitigation, social cohesion and belonging work, or they could do sort of new system reimagination. Uh, but the idea is to invest in them directly, both to mitigate the economic harm that was done to this sector and to these communities, also to engage them in their talent and brilliance for meeting immediate community needs as we're sheltered in place, and as a down payment for the community that we want to build going forward. This is a picture of what is now known as the Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone or the Capitol Hill Occupied Protest. Um, this is, uh, this was a really hard moment for our city and it illuminated so much about what is wrong. Uh, and I'm proud to say that, uh, as violent as this picture appears to be at the precipice of, this is a very peaceful space now. Um, it is complex uh, and it has its own challenges, but, um, we're, we're in a moment where this is the work that we have to do. Civic reimagination is not a, um, a luxury or an option, it is a necessity. Uh, and uh, the events of the last three, week, week, three weeks took the urgency that already existed uh, over the last three months and the last 400 years and, and made them so evident. Um, you know, we know that change will only move at the speed of trust. Uh, and we know that it's going to take uh, it's going to take time, and it's, we're going to have to live in our discomfort. But we are committed as a city and as an arts agency to leaning into this work. The window for for um, for really dramatic policy change in this city and in this country has never been this significant. Um, and I think it is incumbent on all of us to rise to the moment. Um, and I know I can count on GIA to be a partner in that work. And I so appreciate all of you uh, spending this time with us today. So thank you, and I will move us to the Q&A. All right, can everyone hear me? Yeah, you sound great, Sherwin. Okay. All right, well, special thanks to our presenters. That was fantastic. Dana, getting folks to begin to begin to embody putting theory into practice through your closing exercise, um, I think offered a, an iota of the percentage of discomfort that one most may feel when transitioning into more justice uh, funding. And your points, Justin, about the discussion of language when we call out black or indigenous organizations but don't name white ones, I think that was a great point. And I know folks also want to see more about the, the economy cycle um, diagram. So we'll be sure to send that out to folks who are on the webinar um, and register. We'll make sure that you have that. Um, Sharnita, your presentation was great as well. And when you went into the developmental inventory diagram and you spoke about the minimization stage through ad adaptation, I immediately thought of um, the equity versus equality conversation and that key being um, building knowledge in order to be adaptive. So I thought that was great. And then finally, Randy, um, not rebuilding, but building better, um, understanding decisions around who decides. Um, and all of the, the interventions that are happening in Seattle right now, just because, I mean, you were here with us at the beginning of the COVID-19 response programming um, a few months ago. So it's nice to see how things have changed and progressed. And so on that note, we'll, we'll transition over to Q&A. I see that some of you have begun entering your questions. That's great. Please be specific about who the question is for when you enter your question into the Q&A box to the bottom of your screen. And we'll go ahead and kick it off. And so Justin, I'll start with you. Someone asked a question actually immediately after your presentation. So this person first thanks you for bringing up accountability and, and says, there have been a lot of solidarity statements from different arts organizations in reaction to racial equity. Can you talk a little bit more about what this would look like ideally? Um, <clears throat> in, terms of arts, in terms of arts organizations, Sherilyn, is this being asked? I'm sorry? Sherilyn? I said, is that arts, yep. about arts organizations? Is that the question? Okay, yeah. Um, you know, I'm I'm not certain. I haven't 
I guess, you know, I've seen a lot of criticism of, of the statement, and I think the last thing I saw someone talking about um, was just around, you know, we're, we're tired of the statements. I think the key piece of it would be, you know, one is, um, uh, you know, apology, you know, being accountable and clear about how the arts are participating in this in terms of the narratives that are being created and acknowledging that. And the other part, I think, is redress. You know, so what is the commitment and what is the, the standard that is being used so that there is some way to say this is what we define as accountability and this is how you can assess that. I think um, one of the things that's useful to take away from the People's Institute training is this idea that there has to be some other side in anti-racist work. If, it, if there's not some other, um, if you don't establish some way of measuring and showing that the power is being redistributed in some way that you could have some penalty for not doing what you say you're going to do. To me, those are some important principles that you could use to, to, to assess statements and, and to develop them. It's like apology and redress. Great, thank you. And Speaking of policy, I actually want to kick it over to you, Randy. Um, what policy changes could be enacted to advance racial justice? Well, um, I was having this conversation with uh, Angie Kim earlier uh, in the week, but uh, well, maybe it was last week because I can't tell time anymore because it's a flat circle. Um, but, uh, you know, we've in this system of capital campaigns and endowments and, and philanthropy, we've created a, 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 an environment wherein we ask uh, BIPOC communities uh, and, and cultural institutions to really overextend themselves to raise money to buy buildings in neighborhoods they've largely been pushed out of by displacement and gentrification forces. Uh, we make them play this strange capitalist game that has already done all this harm uh, to their communities. One policy change is we could just accept that we're going to cede property, buildings, uh, cede ownership to communities that have been impacted uh, by, in our case, uh, the, the actions of government, for example. Um, so that's one example. Another is things like uh, a job guarantee that's focused on those most impacted, either by COVID or by structural racism. In many cases, it's the same thing. <clears throat> but we actually have the data that says both who's been historically underinvested uh, and who's been impacted disproportionately by this and every other crisis in our nation's history. And we could prioritize uh, you know, anything from a UBI to a job guarantee program um, to help those folks uh, get back to a, a living wage. We, we can build economic policy um, and land use policy and make financial decisions um, through a policy lens that could look very different than what we're doing now. Um, it's just a decision that we have to make uh, as policymakers. So those are just a couple of examples. Great, thank you. The next question is for you, Sharnita. We've got a lot of questions coming in here, so thank you all for being patient. So what processes or tools did you use to level power structures within staff and board in order to successfully do this work together as a united front? That is a really excellent question because it really evolved over over time. So as I said, we sort of started with some baseline sort of cultural competency learning and understanding, which really over time um, led to much deeper conversations, conversations about race, about racial equity, um, about power. And I, I will say specifically um, the work that we did with the Interact Institute for Social Change, who helped us with our um, strategic plan sort of really started to move us into the conversation around understanding um, uh, race and power structures, et cetera. So that was over a period of time. So it's, it's been very incremental, I will say. Um, and that sort of prepared us for the work that we then, then moved into with Justin and Barbary 
um, that really sort of uh, forced us to really interrogate those systems even more at a, at a different level. And I will say that, you know, we're still navigating those things, but certainly we spend a lot of time educating ourselves. As I said, uh, many of us attended um, the Undoing Racism workshop. Um, there were many opportunities to do deeper learning and understanding. And um, as you can see, Justin has a great cadre of books and resources. So he certainly shared those with us. And it really took us in a different sort of trajectory of learning. Um, and then again, we, we had to plot our own journey. So creating our equity framework and our equity rubric was really our attempt at creating tools that made sense to the foundation um, and the systems that we're, that we're operating in because it's not a one-size-fits-all um, endeavor. And, and again, encouraging additional learning, additional inquiry. Um, and so now we have the equity framework and the equity rubric for our grantees, but as I mentioned, we also created a framework for program staff because we started this work at the program level. It will expand to the entire organization, board, and staff. That's great. And I love that you called out um, the fact that a lot of this work is not one size fits all. And so you created your structure based on sort of what you are working with and what's happening in your foundation. And I think that a lot of folks can continue to model after what you're doing while of course keeping in mind that um, everyone is starting at a different point. So that's, that's important to keep in mind. And so I'd like to kick this next question off um, over to Dana and after Dana, you respond. I I believe the uh, register the attendee or participant was is interested in hearing from other folks as well. And so the question or the individual says, I think the idea of the productive disequilibrium as the ideal tension point for learning that results in anti-racist accountability and change is very important. I'm curious if the speakers can describe what the creative disequilibrium looks like for them at this moment from their respective leadership positions. This is Dana, thank you for that question. So um, without having more of a context about the origin for creative disequilibrium, I will say that I think this moment or these moments have been incredible opportunities to leverage change inside of our organizations with respect to culture. Right, so um, I think earlier in my presentation, I talked about how policy changes that created the tax shelter for philanthropy were then codified um, and informed by the corporations, by banking, by academia. And now I think we're at a moment where it's um, both the opportunity for um, us in philanthropy as both Justin and Randy have um, highlighted for us to really reimagine how we can then recenter those who've been historically disinvested in into our processes. So I think at some level on the grant making side, this could look like how do we actually codify um, processes that don't require a lot of bureaucracy? Um, at the endowment level, how do we actually codify um, giving more out now? Um, at the grant making, uh, strategy and decision making level, how do we actually um, decenter the decision making within our philanthropy and actually engage um, our communities in that process? So I think actually this moment is really a big opportunity for us to push hard for some of the changes that we know need to be made and then work to codify those. Great, if anyone else wants to add on to that, I did get another question about um, what are the thoughts of folks who are working at foundations on spending down endowments. And we at GIA have also recently been having conversations about um, what the field is saying about going beyond the 5% requirement um, of spending uh, and grant giving. So 
if anyone has any other, any presenters have any other thoughts before we move on, uh, I know multiple folks are, are interested in hearing. But if not, we can keep responding to other questions. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll say, I think, um, <clears throat> I mean, one, I think, is, is just actually even acknowledging to myself and then the saying, you know, yeah, we actually, we, we, we don't want arts philanthropy in the, future, in the future, you know, and just saying, like, let's, let's name that and just start to really kind of think through what that would be, like, start making that more of a public conversation and being inspired by the Abolish Police discussion, which I think has really been inspiring to see, again, this idea of, like, in a crisis, people pick up the ideas that are on the floor. And I think another one is, is just to, again, to start to participate in conversations in, in community that's like trying to rethink that relationship. And, and so I think those are a couple, um, you know, that I, I would offer. Great, thank you. Um, and this next question comes from one of our participants for, for you, Justin and Randy. And the participant says, in the spirit of universal justice, should GIA be advocating for health care for all and universal basic income? Wouldn't these give by POC communities more agency over their own destiny rather than their, excuse me, rather than having to wait for philanthropy to come to their aid? So what do you think that GIA should be advocating for? Follow you in. for Justin and <laughs> uh, yeah thank you um, I mean I think it's a really interesting question I, I mean if we're talking about um, po fundamental policy change that could be transformational um, you know health care as a human right and a universal basic income are 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 really powerful interventions I think I don't I, I don't know if that is a space that it makes sense for GIA to um, weigh in on, although I think that would be a conversation that we could have as the board and that we could have with our membership. And I do think that BIPOC communities potentially would benefit from that. I mean, everybody would benefit from having health care and everybody would benefit from having universal basic income. But I think it's about how it's designed and implemented and who is at the table to design and implement it. Because my fear with those systems, with any system, is that it's designed by the same people that have been designing systems for a very long time. And we would not get to different outcomes because we would be um, vulnerable to the same biases and the same sort of dominant culture defaults around uh, doing what we think is best for people. So I think GIA would really want to lean hard on self-determination more than on a particular uh, public policy intervention. But that's just my read. I haven't obviously spoken to any of my board colleagues about that or, or any staff. Yeah, I, guess I would just add, I think, you know, with the idea of um, a critical race lens to it, that to be skeptical or critical, or critical about universal frames and that that, that they may have this idea of like, we're gonna remove bias. But with so much bias, I think we need reparatory frames. And so I think with, and I think particularly if GIA was looking at reparatory frames around culture, that could really be its location. And then it might influence a, a bunch of other systems. I, I do think that GIA would have some challenges regarding all the boards that are involved. And that's what I saw you know in the past, but it, at least if it stayed in its lane and it and it talks about reparation, and it talks about healing and some other frameworks, maybe that could also be another way to influence. Great, well, thank you for that, for that perspective, especially as a staff member of GIA. Um, we are continuing to, to explore other ways of advocating for justice and in intersectional arts and culture uh, fields and so that is helpful feedback and I, I know we'll continue that conversation so no worries Randy. <laughs> um, so Sharnita I kind of want to go back to you and because when you talked about your framework um, you had put it together you and the Dodd Foundation had put it together before COVID-19 sort of took over the nation slash world um, so you had to make some adjustments and you sort of mentioned that in your presentation, but can you go a little bit deeper into it? And, and I want us to, to revisit this just because um, I know folks are, are still 
while while many people are in recovery phase, pe- a lot of people are still in response phase or response mode. And so, um, if you could offer a little bit more about how you how you adjusted and certain things that you had to keep in mind um, that you wouldn't have had to if COVID nineteen wasn't a part of the equation. So um, I think a, a couple of things, and as I mentioned, sort of we, we're on a trajectory. Um, there was a lot of learning that had to happen. There were lots of um, conversations that we needed to have that we kind of weren't having, and one of them really was around. We did um, quite a bit of research and just looking at, um, you know, your zip code should just not determine the kind of life that you have. And basically, you know, anecdotally, we realized that, but looking at the research, we understood across all of the indicators for health, for education, for employment, all of those things, the black and brown communities in New Jersey were not doing well at all. And the wealth gap is so severe. The average black family in New Jersey has a net worth of $5,000 and the average net worth of a white family in New Jersey is upwards of 200000 So those are just things I don't know that we have been really thinking about or talking about. So it was a fair amount of educating um, ourselves mm-hmm. and the board and to a degree the grantees. So this process, as I said, sort of got us to the place where we have these theories of change that actually name these communities that talk about the structural and historical um, barriers. And COVID sort of just laid bare these things that not that we didn't necessarily know, but that we weren't necessarily talking about in a particular way. So there were, there, I believe that the number in New Jersey is over 12,000 deaths. I may be um, exaggerating that, but it's still a large number. So this community has been impacted in, the state has been impacted um, in tremendous ways as everyone else in the country. But again, we were prepared to have these conversations because of the work that we have been doing leading up to it. And then when it came time to really think about how are we going to who are we going to support and how are we going to support them? We were able to use our equity framework to say, we know that communities of color are going to be additionally challenged to respond to all of the needs of their community. So when we made these rapid response grants, we were able to, uh, to use the framework to think about the organizations that we were going to support in that way. And also with the number of pooled funds that have been established for emergency support around food assistance, health, rent, rental assistance, all those sorts of things, we were able to share the framework with our grantee partners as well as other funders to help them really think about how are they going to disperse these dollars. And I believe over time is certainly going to um, – create an opportunity for us to continue this conversation, but certainly on a larger scale and with other funders and the nonprofit sector in the state. So I think, as I said, it's sort of been incremental and built upon itself, but we were ready to sort of understand the gravity and the impact on these communities because we had done the work previously. Great, thank you. Ooh. Thank you. All right, so our next question to all panelists, do you see a way that explicit that explicitly by POC nonprofits can flip the script and engage in ways of fundraising that allow them for more agency without depending on the bureau, bure- excuse me, everyone bureaucracies of established foundations to create EIDA granting programs. So all can respond. Um, so just, I'll just say that what many of us didn't, that's, um, specifically does a lot of general operating 
grant making anyway. But I think the speed in which sort of philanthropy dropped those barriers um, allowed project grants to be um, shifted into general operating grants. Um, I think Randy may have mentioned that there were um, there were no application processes for some grants. Um, the same with our rapid response grant. So I think that we learned um, that we can be nimble um, and that maybe we need to re-examine why we have those systems in place in the first place. Um, so, and I think that that was sort of what was happening across the country as many foundations were making, um, really innovating and iterating on a dime to, to get resources to the communities that needed them. So I think we have this as an example of, we did this and, you know, nothing sort of imploded. So it's, it's possible to do. Great. I guess I would, I, I totally agree with what Sharnita said. And I think we learned institutionally through COVID that we in fact can change quickly. We can adapt, we can move. Um, particularly thinking about government bureaucracy at a speed much faster than we thought was possible. And that speed was only matched by uh, how quickly it turns out we can move um, in this moment that we're in. And I think you've seen incredible reforms and policy change happen as a result of the calls for justice uh, across the country. And, um, you know, I would offer that the, that collective organizing model, the organizing that we're seeing happen in communities across the country is accelerating the policy change window in a way that I've never personally seen. So, you know, the degree to which uh, BIPOC cultural workers or cultural organizers can work together and, and call for changes, we know that the institutions can change and we know that with enough pressure they will. So I think those are both things that, that seem like opportunities from, from my vantage. Awesome. All right, so we've got another question that sort of pivots us to looking toward the uh, rural sort of parts of the country. And the person asks, does anyone have any thoughts or suggestions on initiating and implementing these structural or systemic changes in rural areas? Are there key differences you'd see in approaching change, either in government, arts, institutions, higher education, funding, et cetera? And they say, whoever's, whoever's comfortable speaking to this, um, please do um, in rural and urban areas. We'll hold that question then for post the webinar where we can get a little bit more clarity on that. Um, and so for our next question, this is going to you, Dana. Part of your presentation included a quote from Ibram X. Kendi. And it's, it's definitely relevant <laughs> now and even before now. And so just thinking about um, white supremacy. And so how is Justice Funders thinking about the connection between being an anti-racist and anti-capitalist um, in your work in philanthropy? Thanks. Um, well, I think as Justin highlighted in his presentation, racial capitalism is reinforced um, by the well, by philanthropy and in our economy in general, um, and I would say is really uh, notable in the practice of um, how our philanthropies invest nearly 95% of their assets um, in the market economy to fund the very industries that harm black and brown communities, um, such as the prison and military industrial complexes. 
so in thinking about, you know, what it means to not only have anti-racist, um, but also anti-capitalist practices, I think it would really mean uh, for our foundations looking at how do we and, uh, divest our endowments um, from industries like prison and military, money bail, predatory lending, speculative real estate, um, corporations that exploit low-wage workers, and then think about how we're reinvesting that capital in local and regional economic development projects that build shared prosperity in Black, Indigenous, uh, and POC communities. Um, I think Randy had some great examples from the Seattle community. Um, I would also say that for the question proceeding about rural areas, um, how are our indigenous territories um, and their work to govern and steward their lands lessons for all of us? Um, so those are some of the ways in which I think um, thinking about the connection between being anti-racist and anti-capitalist um, are some of the ways that Justice Funders is now thinking about that question. Thanks, Sherilyn. Great. And um, no problem. So that was fantastic. We've actually come to the end of our our webinar. It really flew by today, I would say. Um, but I do want to thank our presenters, Dana, Justin, Sharnita, and Randy, for your incredible presentations and for speaking about um, really speaking to sort of like what's been <laughs> what's been happening forever, but like how now more than ever is such a an important time for everyone to to move and to act and to respond um, so that we can build better and toward what a world and philanthropic sector that we would imagine. And so for everyone who is wondering and who has asked, today's presentation has been recorded and you will be receiving a link to the recorded file as well as a presentation slides in the next few days. We also invite you to take a brief survey that we will share immediately following the webinars because we would like to know what you thought. We will continue sharing COVID-19 response information and resources on our website. We hope you will visit and keep the conversation going on how we can reimagine the future of philanthropy while ensuring racial equity is and remains centered. If you have further questions, feel free to reach out to me, Sherilyn Seeley. And thank you so much for joining us. Have a great day, everyone.